Welcome back and thanks to our previous uh, speakers. The next panel is what should Special Operations Forces look like by 2040? Joining us is Lieutenant Colonel Katie Kroom from Special Operations Command, uh, Major Akil Ayer from Marine Special Operations Command, Captain Shea Haver, aide de camp to the Commander Joint Task Force National Capital Region and Military District of Washington, and Commander Chief Master Sergeant Greg Smith, Special Operations Command Senior Enlisted Leader. This conversation is going to be moderated by Colonel Ike Wilson, uh, who is uh, president of the Joint Special Operations University. He's also a senior fellow in the International Security Program at New America, uh, professor of practice at Arizona State University. Uh, and before we hear from our speakers, we're going to have a short video from Joint Special Operations University. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Ike Wilson, and I am the president of the Joint Special Operations University at United States Special Operations uh, Command, uh, SOCOM. It's a great pleasure uh, for me today, personally and professionally, to uh, be with you today and to frankly be moderating what promises, or at least I'll hope to promise, will be a, um, a great and exciting and frankly a provocative 45-minute uh, discussion. Uh, we have a very amount of uh, a very tight amount of time before us, and as moderator, I'm going to make a, a couple of opening uh, framing comments just to kind of warm up the uh, the living room here, the virtual living room, uh, to get some provocations going. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to our great uh, panelists today. And I want to just thank Peter Bergen for the great uh, intro uh, of each of them, and um, for myself as well. Um, Okay, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty here. I'm seeing the chat, but I'm sure that'll work itself out. You all can hear me. 
Um, our panel today, uh, we're going to take on the question straightforward, and then I've asked each of our panelists to uh, give us a, a quick, tight five minutes or so provocation to uh, put some more meat on the bones of the question. Again, the question before us today is what should special operations forces look like by 2040? What, I want, what we're going to do in our comments is we're going to expand on that question, and not only are we going to um, address what should soft look like by the year 2040, but what must soft be and become by 24? And that being and becoming starts today. And so with that as moderator, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just give us some provocations, try to frame us out a little bit. And then I'm gonna turn it right over to Lieutenant Colonel Katie Crone, um, uh, the uh, US uh, D uh, Director of Strategy Plans and Policy, uh, the J-5 in military jargon of the uh, US Special Operations Command, Central Command. Uh, so first, a uh, just some provocation. Um, I would offer that soft, like the nations that we serve, are at yet another threshold crossing. The need to reorient the soft enterprise for this coming fourth age, what we regard as the fourth age of soft, is motivated by the unique challenges posed by a very major feature of the strategic and operational environment. That feature is a change in the character of global geopolitical competition, what we're calling and what we're theorizing as a new compound security dilemma. Now, striking a proper rebalancing between all of SOF's past, and particularly its most recent past, the so-called GWAT era, requires a delicate maneuver between recognizing the nuances of the compound security dilemma that are present in current and future threats and revisiting the past to learn how our future shapes the present. Through this critical lens, we can forecast what changes are required to be more com comprehensively effective in the future compound security environment. Now, what will be SOF's challenge in all of this? I offer that it's nothing less than the classic innovator's dilemma, striking the right balance between leading change and preserving and protecting the essence of who SOF is, who SOF has been, based on what SOF has done for nation and how. For the United States Special Operations Command, this is our prime directive as soft professionals. Now this soft, this compound security character of the global security environment is such that it demands a utility of soft that is equally compounded. Now, what do I mean by that? That's to say a comprehensive combination of all the skills, techniques, and operational methods of all three preceding ages, taking us back as early as the World War II era, amplified, all that amplified by 21st century technological advancements. I'd offer that nothing less than this comprehensive joint combined utility of soft philosophy, culture, and approach is required for overmatching power in and under these fourth age conditions. Nothing less, folks, than a trans everything view of and approach to special operations forces, use utility, and identity. Now, with that, I'm going to turn it over and, uh, uh, to Lieutenant Colonel Katie Crone. Katie, you've got uh, about five minutes. Please provoke. Over to you, mm -hmm. Katie. Thanks, Dr. Wilson, and thanks to all my fellow panelists for sharing in this important conversation today. So right now I'm in the fortunate, although it hasn't seemed like that lately, position to be part of the theoretical conversation of how to employ soft in the future, and also part of the ongoing experiment. We live it every day at Special Operations Command Central as we have purview or remit over the 22 countries in the Middle East and Central and South Asia. Never a day goes by that we don't talk about the what ifs, though, the what next, and how we can do this better in the future. Although the larger defense apparatus is shifting its resources and intellectual capital toward China and Russia, I think the instability that generated the trauma of terrorism over the past two decades has definitely not subsided in the Middle East. In fact, many of the root causes that contributed to this threat have multiplied and are now exacerbated by climate change, changes to energy access, and the global pandemic. These conditions present opportunities for both global and regional adversaries alike to pursue their goals of fomenting unrest and undermining regimes that are friendly to the US. They're attempting to break us from our alliances, which as everyone knows is our center of gravity in the Department of Defense and the US government at large. So how can we in special operations stem this tide? How can we position ourselves with human capital and technological advances to create upstream approaches to this burgeoning dilemma? A big piece of this answer lies in how soft creates understanding in order to influence. The irregular warfare annex of the national defense strategy begins to tackle this 
it states that the irregular warfare is a persistent and enduring operational reality employed by non-state and increasingly now state actors like Russia and China in competition with the United States. Irregular warfare is defined as the struggle to influence populations and affect legitimacy. The annex goes on to talk about five core missions, unconventional warfare, stabilization, foreign internal defense, counterterrorism, and of course, counterinsurgency. And states that IW is not just a soft mission, but a core competency for the department writ large. Although all the movies and books that everyone's seen for the past two decades highlight counterterrorism and direct action as our primary missions, in the past 20 years, we grew in others as well, and perhaps more importantly. We evolved and innovated across all of the population-focused areas, including military information support operations, cyberspace ops, counter-threat networks, really importantly, counter-threat financing, civil military operations, and security cooperation. It's here where we will continue to serve as thought leaders for DOD. These aren't extracurricular or nice to have skill sets. They are at the core of special operations. Soft is not about being better or being elite. Special is about being different. In 2001, we became what the nation needed and we will do that again. We're designed to operate in the human environment and that is where we will continue to provide outsized value. We need to be brilliant in the basics. We need to shift from a bias for action towards a bias for understanding. We must develop our enterprise, our humans, to understand. We need to focus on the cognitive dimension as the key terrain in every way. The influence campaigns both virtually and physically around the globe. Cognitive change requires patience, a long view that's important in the execution of regular warfare. Part of this is an effective campaign that will require recognizing certain effects take longer than others. Return on investments is a really difficult thing to measure in the near term and midterm. Allegedly, the Chinese approach is anchored on a hundred year outlook. We could probably learn a few lessons from that. Cognitive change also requires partnerships, both internal within the USG and external with partners and allies. These relationships, both physical and virtual, are our and will remain our keystone. While some are promoting the soft machine fusion as the way forward, I would caution fully against RMA 2.0 reliance. Yes, machine learning and AI can process data at light speeds, but these platforms are not able to provide context. There is no man in the loop or woman in the loop. Each human requires larger, more nuanced knowledge base and experience enabled by true overhead talent management system. We can't just download a language like the matrix into a human brain or rely on a translation app without divorcing it from the larger cultural context that provides us meaning. Soft plus tech does not equal the solution. Relying on a small number of elite troops married to advanced sensors, communication platforms, PGMs, and AI does not guarantee immediate victory and definitely not long-term long -term consolidation of gains. All these changes may drive a requirement to develop structures and to think differently about how we are organized. To do this, we have to institutionalize adaptation, especially regarding the understanding that is necessary to prevail against irregular activities, irregular adversaries. Adaptation is more than just technological advances. We may finally have to get rid of some of the sacred cows we've been holding onto for so long. So from big to small, just some food for thought for the panel. Within our own service, we can look at career management and promotion structure, not just things like battalion and brigade command, but things like soft as its own service or as a profession. Next, looking at deployment and readiness cycles, not to be the full drivers of a forward presence. Soft must be present forward to build relationships, access, and truly understand. It's not full T, Lawrence, but there's a bit of that here. We need a better way to, under, to ensure readiness that accounts for human-centric aspects of irregular warfare and keeping people forward. And last, we need to look at the UCP and GCC structure. Perhaps look at replacing it with a structure that allows Soft to thrive as a true integrator between the interagency and the intelligence community, and be a force multiplier. The SecDef's recent integrated deterrence initiative really builds on this and begins to address the importance of bringing all these tools from different government organizations together. And I think we can maybe use that as a forcing function to look at something like a Goldwater Nichols 2.0. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. That was excellent. Hey, uh, Major uh, Akil Iyer of the United States Marine Corps Special Operations Command. Uh, Akil, over to you. Five minutes. 
provoke us. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Dr. Wilson and Nokrom. Thanks so much for, uh, for for setting the stage. You know, I'll uh, I'll take the perspective here less so as Major Akil Iyer and just Akil Iyer, the the individual who transitioned in 2019 to a, a business school program, and and try and put a little bit of a business lens on what arguably is one of uh, our nation's most successful startups uh, going back to to its roots. And I'll I'll offer three comments uh, as I think about that. Now, the first is, I don't think we're the only ones, uh, as many organizations uh, experience at a contextual and environmental inflection point, we're not the only ones trying to refine and stress test our core competencies and our competitive advantage going forward. I I remember uh, in a recent Naval War College discussion, a a quote that I wrote down was, if you are uncomfortable, if I'm sorry, if you are comfortable in the DOD right now, it's probably because you are irrelevant. I think that strikes me as something that, you know, we're not the only uh, service or service-like component dealing with this. Um, it reminds me of my, my old hat uh, as a conventional infantryman, as a lieutenant on Muse. And I would argue actually that uh, this inflection point geopolitically uh, creates some opportunities to figure out how soft can act as a connector to not just the broader conventional force, but even new members of the force like we heard from today, that being the space force. And I think this relationship of soft being as a connector I think might be at inflection in terms of how we think about the supported supporting relationship, something that might be a little, a little different than how many of us have experienced over the past 20 years. I don't think this connection uh, ecosystem needs to be a zero sum game of whether it's soft or whether it's a conventional force, but rather I think a much more integrated set of solutions and capabilities whose holistic value is greater than the sum of the parts. The second point I'll bring up, and Dr. Wilson, I think you hit on it very well, was this idea of the innovator's dilemma. Um, you know, traditionally in the business world, innovator's dilemma is used to describe an incumbent who has succeeded very well, created a sustainable business model, uh, but only provides marginal improvements to its existing customers. But that's it. It's only marginal improvements. It's not a radically new value proposition or capability applied to some new customer or problem set. Now, how does this apply to soft? The late Professor Clay Christensen, uh, you know, who really wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, I think captured it best in one of his, his articles, and I think it relates well here. Incumbent companies should not overreact to disruption by dismantling a still profitable business. Instead, they should strengthen relationships with core customers while also creating a new division focused on the growth and opportunities that arise from this disruption. I think that leads to my, my third point, which, ma'am, you, you highlighted very well, and that's how do we incentivize and organize soft from the bottom up to fit the form to the function of what soft can and will do, uh, be, and be asked to do in the future? Um, and how do we, one, create the incentives uh, to ensure that culture, that culture, as you know, many uh, all, all often too quoted, is uh, culture eating strategy for breakfast. And I would argue, and many would argue, that you know, it's also the incentives that influence the culture. Um, are we tangibly and intangibly influencing the incentives when it comes to our selection, our recruitment, our training, and our career pipelines, uh, ones that emphasize the right skill development or the right types of experiences we want as we think about the great power competition arena? The last point I'll make in regards to this, this idea of, of incentives and, 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 or, and organization, I think this is for me coming from business school, one of the biggest mental shifts I made from active duty is how do you combine incentives uh, with an, a true ability to have organizational experimentation? And I think finding some ways to instill enterprise level agility, despite the fact that SOCOM is no longer that small startup from the 1980s, but is rather an established incumbent, I think can still be achieved. But we need to find adequate ways to enable that experimentation, um, which may be including task organized units or unique cross-functional experimentation with technologies, uh, but ultimately be able to incubate that and scale it where appropriate. So looking forward to the discussion today, and, and, and thanks again for joining. Bill, thanks for that. Thanks very much. Um, Captain Shea Haver, aide-de-camp to the Commander Joint Task Force National Capital Region and Military District of Washington and Army Ranger. Uh, Shea, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, and thanks to everybody um, on the panel today. Really looking forward to being part of the conversation, uh, constantly learning and growing from everybody's perspective. So um, first, I just kind of want to hit on um, both uh, Colonel Crom and, and Major Air are already 
kind of took a, a little bit of a glimpse into this, but as we move towards more of a technological um, idealism and moving to solve problems in that way, that um, uh, my, my provocation here is that we'll never be able to completely eliminate uh, the hu humanity out of it. Um, and that, that, that the human aspect is going to be something that we will have to continue to, to focus on. I think what's going to be unique and interesting is that uh, moving forward, uh, we're, we're going to have the same amount of jobs, if not more, um, and we're going to have to recruit the right people to fit those jobs. Um, and in this uh, generation, maybe even um, motivating people to either stay in or to continue to contribute to this conversation, uh, moving it forward, what the competition will look like. We're going to be working with a generation that more than likely uh, doesn't have the same experiences um, that the, the total force may have had over the 20 years uh, of experience um, where we have been. So not only are we are we kind of trying to shift culture, right, we're also trying to um, create something uh, in a different way, kind of new, and we're going to have to rely on on uh, that bottom-up refinement that um, Major Air has talked about. Um, so really, really interested in how, you know, we're going to tie that into our conversation today with some of the soft truths um, and uh, keep in, keeping in mind that um, it, overcoming a ger generation of more, you know, individualism and isolationism, how we do that, how do we maintain uh, a culture um, for uh, the military in general, but for soft moving forward in these very specific um, ideas um, as we uh, kind of culminate uh, in that, but really looking forward to the conversation and uh, thank you so much. Shay, thanks so much and great Army Ranger form. You came in uh, well under the five minutes. So I appreciate that you've given us some time back. Uh, folks, before I introduce our, our uh, final uh, quick provo provocateur, uh, I just wanna make sure that I wanna give the audience, our, our living room audience, some time, um, some information on how to submit questions. Uh, folks will be using uh, uh, Slido, sli.do to submit questions. Slido is the box located to the right of the video. Uh, if you encounter issues in attempting to uh, load up your questions uh, using Slido, please contact events at newamerica.org. Okay, and without further ado, I want to uh, turn it over to to our Command Chief Master Sergeant, Greg A. Smith. Uh, Command Chief Smith is the 10th uh, Senior Enlisted Leader of the U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, he's our senior leader, so I could not think of a better way of rounding out the provocations other than turning it over to uh, Command Chief Smith. Greg, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. And as always, uh, it's always a big struggle to back clean up behind three eloquent uh, leaders uh, that make me feel very confident in the future of our force. Uh, from a person that's really the past of our force. Um, with somebody with more than 26 years in special operations of my 31 plus years of service, I've watched the second, third, and now the fourth age of SOF as Dr. Wilson coins it. Um, and as the last enlisted airman in our United States Air Force on active duty who came in before Desert Shield, it's also an important inflection point as we look at the evolution of the military and special operations in, in, uh, in general, as we look at how we got here, where we're at, and where we're going. I will tell you, as we struggle, and I say that because on behalf of General Clark and the leadership team here, we spend an enormous and inordinate amount of time questioning those truths, not our soft truths, but those truths that we've known for these last 20 years of how relevant they will be going forward. And in that questioning and through significant inflection, we've come up with kind of four key areas that SOFT will continue and into the future, foreseeable future. And that first as evidenced by the recent events in Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world in places like Haiti in support of Hurricane Ida and other crises is this, is this concept of crisis response. SOFT's innate ability to get from point A to point B in a rapid fashion to move to the sounds of the guns or the sounds of the cries is the significant single most important value proposition we can offer our nation as it offers the nation's decision makers time and space to make decisions. We can, we can question those decisions and we have the luxury of doing that, but we do not have the question, we do not have the luxury of questioning response time. So special operations forces and crisis response will always be the nation's key advantage. The second is, this continuing counter violent extremist operations. Although we see the events in Afghanistan and other places around the world, a more sustainable approach, 
terrorism, counterterrorism, and those who ideologically seek to destroy or usurp everything this great nation stands for will continue to be present. Those things require unique solutions. And as Colonel Crom brought up, this irregular warfare concept and by, with, and through our allies and partners will continue to be our key strength as we go forward. The third kind of important uh, hinge point here is in state-on-state -state conflict. As we prepare for the nation to avoid war, we prepare for war as a military. Special operations has been the supported force the majority of the last 20 years. Reconnecting with our services and integrating into the joint force as a supporting, enabling portion of this uh, element of that will be important for our decision makers. And then finally, this continuous continuum of competition, everything co from cooperation to conflict on both ends of this, both at state, near peer, and middle peer uh, conflicts or disagreements will continue. Uh, when we talk about China, I'll use China as a quick example, and we look at things. Uh, China is not necessarily a military threat, but it has military capabilities that threaten United States capabilities. China's economic growth, and when we look at it through four lenses, and that's the Silk Road economic belt, the 21st century maritime Silk Road, the polar Silk Road, and the digital Silk Road, these threaten to underpin the economic engine that is the United States that gives us that access and placement. So Special Operations Force's ability to characterize the nature of this by, with, and through friendly countries and understand dual-use facilities and potential threats is a key and important enabling function for our decision makers. These things through the next 20 to 40 years will continue to be truths that we see in the operational environment. And those things require uniquely assessed and selected individuals. To use Major Iyer's point, do we have the right individuals today to do these things tomorrow? These are the inflection points that we face today to make sure that we are inclusive in the entire problem set to make sure that we are getting after and addressing the nation's key challenges. With that, I yield my time back to you, Dr. Wilson. Command Chief Greg, that was ex that was excellent. Um, what I'd like to do, we have we already have some great questions forming up from the uh, the virtual living room audience. Um, before I do, before I go to that, we've got a. I want to take a couple of minutes. Uh, and kind of come back to what was a harmonizing theme across all of your comments, but I thought uh, who put it best um, was uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Crone. Uh, Katie, you, you said uh, we have to be brilliant in the basics. We have to remain brilliant. I would say exquisitely so brilliant in the basics while also remaining human, right? And again, Shay, Captain, Ca Captain Haver uh, emphasized this as well. You all did. Um, I'm, I'm haunted by the fact that uh, part of the American way of peace and warfare is a heavy reliance on technology, right? And what we're, when we're talking about a fourth age of soft, it really comes into coincidence and increasingly is going to come in collision with the fourth technological revolution as well. And again, Major uh, Iyer spoke to this a bit as well. So the natural proclivity to at times of strategic ambiguity and unknown strategic inflection points to tilt towards more of the reliance on hopeful solutions through the hyper enablement through tech solutions of the leader operator. While we certainly have to do that, how do we, how do, we do that at the same time of getting maintaining that equipoise, that balance, that healthy balance between becoming hyper enabled at Vanguard on these technological changes um, while also remaining soft truth number one human over all things, much less hardware. I'd, I'd like to just put that before you and give you guys maybe, a, you know, a 30 seconds or so to kind of, you know, give some thoughts on it. And it's open to whoever wants to start it out. Well, I'll start real quick and just say the hyper-enabled operator is really about three key concepts. It's about power, right? How do I power and how do I do those things? It's about projection. How do I leverage data satellite, all these other capabilities across multiple, multiple domains to project capability. And it's about protection. How do I synthesize and rework industry plates, uh, carrier, uh, transport to make sure I'm protecting the operator. But at the end of all of it, it's about the human that is enabled by this rapid influx of technology. Outstanding. 
Hey, Major, I'm going to pick on you because you, you and I had a conversation about this a little bit last week. I know you have something to say on this. Um, we did. We did. It. I think we were joking last time. Um, you know, Shay and I, even though we're the youngest on this panel, I think we uh, ourselves are old in the sense that we're not digitally native. Um, you, we have a generation of young, uh, you know, aspiring special operations personnel who did grow up in that environment. And I, I would argue they are part and parcel of that solution. The technology, you know, I, uh, in my, res, you know, I'm in the reserves. And so my, my full-time work is dealing with technology investments to include artificial intelligence. And at the end of the day, I think it reinforces Chief Smith's point and that it's, it's about the people and the ability of those individuals to understand the capabilities and limitation what's going into those types of systems and then how we use it uh, and to leverage the capability of our, our young soldier sh sailors, airmen, Marines, uh, who grew up in that digitally native environment, who have been tooling with the Raspberry Pi since the age of seven uh, and can bring some of those competencies I think are critical. Outstanding. And I, I would just add our, our new, new members to the team, to the soft team, our, our space guardians, who we're, we're beginning the early work now, try to figure out what that looks like from a soft componency. So even more so in terms of that challenge of maintaining and, and preserving that perfect equipoise. Again, the innovator's dilemma, you know, preserving who we are as human beings, a human at the, at the heart of what we do, the, the human essence of what we do, while leveraging to the hilt um, uh, advanced technology. Uh, uh, hey, uh, Shay, I'll uh, turn it over to you, see if you have any thoughts to add. Yeah, the one the one comment that I was going to make is that I think that we um, are, are going to have a challenge for ourselves to appeal to that generation who did um, grow up, you know, essentially, you know, the, the iPhone in their hand, right? It's like, how does that translate now into uh, how they can serve and how they can be recruited into these these positions? So um, those skills might not necessarily translate for them, uh, and they're going to see, you know, probably what they think that soft is um, from a historical standpoint, and not necessarily what it is being. Uh, projected to be. And so uh, us finding a way uh, and us meaning, you know, the, the active military now and, and how do we recruit the right people for some jobs that maybe don't even exist yet, um, getting people to think because they're going to be the ones that are going to solve, you know, some of these, these future problems. So uh, we might be doing the nug work of coming out with the orders and, you know, doing the, the late night, you know, backroom planning sessions, but really what is it that we're getting out to the rest of um, uh, the population to be able to recruit these individuals? Um, and, and to meet them where they are so that they're not intimidated by the fact that like, hey, I don't have, you know, the experience of being, you know, finding a, this past, you know, 20 year war uh, under my belt. Uh, how do I, you know, how do I contribute? Um, and, and very necessarily, they, they might be the solution. So, so getting them to see that, I think, is a challenge and something that we need to start doing now. That's great. Uh, Katie, I'm going to, since you, since I used your provocation to, for this question, I'm going to ask you to maybe take this in the opposite direction that um, that uh, uh, Major Iyer and um, Shea took it. They talked about the challenge of you all as the as from my perspective, the young the young the youngsters in trying to communicate downstream to those Gen Gen um, Zers, the di the true digital natives. What's your all's challenge and their challenge even more so in translating that up echelon? to old soldiers, sailors, airmen, once and young, but no longer. You know, Command Chief Greg Smith is always forever young, so I won't put him in that in my category. I'll just pick up myself, representing, you know, the old folks that are far from being digital natives, um, and, and but still in positions where you've got to convince us as the executives of what all this means and how it means for change going forward. Any thoughts on that before we turn it over to the Yeah, audience? sure. That actually... I was watching the video at the beginning and I, I kind of went back to what I always feel about the posters and the, the, the stamps or the, the branding of special operations. And it's, you know, the night vision goggles and the operator with all of the, the gear, you know, going into a building. And I thought, you know, that's, that's not what we need to be advertising fully right now. Of course, it's a huge part of it. And I know it does help recruit some people that we need, but you know, if we all agree that the future is different, the people and the mindset and the, the creativity that we're trying to recruit right now is much different than that. And I think it comes down to things like words do matter, you know, hyper enabled operator, right? The last word is operator. Um, all MOS's professions within special operations need to be hyper enabled, you know, and that goes back to this understand function. 
but I think it's difficult for the more senior generations. I mean, we have super forward thinkers like Chief Smith and you and Mitch Bradley and General Clark, people that really do want to change, but I think it is difficult for them to promote and bring up talent um, that looks different than them. And I'm not talking in, in physical appearance, but has a different resume than them. It just, it doesn't compute somehow in these boards, right? And so people often ask, I mean, we talked about this last week. If you said 10 years ago, what does a panel for special operations 2040 look like? You know, they all, it was Chief Smith times five, right? And if you look at, <laughs> as handsome as he is, but if you look at, you know, Dr. Wilson, Major Iyer, Captain Haver, me, you know, we, we are definitely not the recruiting poster for special operations. Um, but I would say that we are at the forefront of a lot of thought within the community. Um, and with the expertise above us, when we all come together, we are, you know, we're pitching some creative solutions that are being latched onto, you know, around the globe with the National Security Council and things like that. But it's, it will become increasingly difficult to hold on to people like Shay. And I mean, look, Major Iyer's already out in the Harvard Business School. You know, I mean, they will be recruited outside if they aren't properly talent managed. And I think that's, you know, what I spend a lot of time translating up above, you know, trying to bring people underneath me that don't look, you know, I don't look soft. Some of my, you know, most talented um, guys and gals that work for me, they do not look the part, um, but they are an absolute requirement to, to make special operations command successful going forward. And it's just about reminding these guys on a daily basis that that's true. And usually they, they do listen. And I'll just say that from our, my seat, uh, Colonel Chrome is more soft than most people that I know. Just so you know, I mean, in the sense of her thought and what she does for these commands. There's there's a reason why she's she's handpicked to be one of our our preeminent war and peace planners. Uh, not said on that. Um, you know, Katie, to your point about you know how do you keep folks like yourselves and we'll we'll pick on Akil uh, specifically. How do you keep how do you keep them in? How do you keep the talent inside the force? I think even thinking beyond what constitutes inside and outside the force, right, is something we've got to we've got to rethink, right. And the ability to actually leverage opportunities for folks to for you all to rotate in and out, if you will, of the of the active formations, and just think of the integrated statecraft and beyond statecraft solutions that we can get when we start thinking about those those kind of things. What is likewise? What is a 21st century equivalent of a old 18th 19th century approach to breveting, right? To where we're putting we're putting rank and accoutrements to mission sets, not to individuals. Right, we had it in some respects, uh, really right in the past. How do you how do you go back to our futures in those respects? Is just some of the things that all of your comments really inspired. Let me open this up to um, to our audience. We've got some great questions here that are all in line with with what we're uh, what we're talking about so far. Uh, let me start right at the top of the list here. Uh, I'm just going to make this open from everyone. Um, Bad strategy often comes from flawed assumptions. What are the wrong assumptions about what we need from soft that would lead to bad strategy for the, for the future? And I'm going to just make this open jump ball. Whoever wants to jump and get it first, go for it. I, I can just jump in really quick because, you know, following Colonel Crom, I, I appreciate your comments because 100% I think that um, – one of the getting to this question too. One of the things is like, what what wrong would be is just assuming that we just keep doing the same thing or that everybody has to look the same. We're going to end up having to put people probably that look different or may not even have the right experiences into positions of uh, change, uh, into positions of responsibility or authority to make decisions, um, surrounded by a team to progress the team forward um, that that are going to fail, and we're going to have to be comfortable. Uh, being uncomfortable, uh, and I think that that's probably the the biggest and first takeaway. Uh, it's got it's going to look different um, than probably a lot of people are comfortable with, and, and we're going to have to be uncomfortable uh, moving forward. The goodness in that is that it's a team effort, and that the individual, you know, the, the uh, if we're playing, if we're doing it right, because we're thinking about it and talking about it and planning it now, um, but that one individual um, will be surrounded by the right team, so it's it'll be the right person, but the right team as well uh, to continue to perpetuate that on. Um, but but I, but I think that that's just one, you know, one aspect or one facet to kind of get after that question and also to highlight what uh, Colonel Crom was talking about there. To Colonel Crom, uh, Major Iyer, any any comments? 
Anything to add? Anything to add? Okay, nothing heard. All right, next question. Um, by 2040, the people SOCOM are recruiting today will be leading the enterprise. What new different attributes should we be screening for in those future leaders today? Yeah, I'll take that one first. I mean, you know, as a, a woman in soft without the the opportunity to, you know, go to ranger school and everything that shaded, not saying that I would have passed this by any means, but it wasn't allowed back then, thank God. Um, uh, you know, there's always been, you always feel like a second class citizen without the tabs and the accoutrements and everything that comes with that. And so I think that when we do look to recruit and assess, we need to put things like, you know, writing, reading, speaking, problem solving, um, almost ahead, not, not ahead all the way, but equal at least as, as the physical testing. You know, I think that it's always an afterthought and it probably needs to be on the same playing field. Um, it's very rare that people get dropped. You know, we all have friends, relatives that have been through the series of schools across the services, you know, from BUDS to, to Delta training and all of that. And you never hear about people getting, you know, dropped for intellectual shortfalls. It's the mountain phase or, you know, frostbite or something like that. And I think that when it comes to the challenges that we're facing right now, a strategic competition. Um, it's the problem solving and creative solutions that paralyze senior leaders um, and, you know, that, that stymie progress right now. And so those are the things that I think we really need to be testing in the future to make sure we're recruiting. And, you know, Colonel Crumb's on a pretty good point here of as we've re-looked at assessment as part of our comprehensive review of looking where we're at. Is really about critical and creative thinking, thinking in time, ethical thinking, and then design thinking. Dr. Wilson, as you know, kind of the five elements of thinking, if you will, and that all falls under cognitive agility, which should weigh significantly more. We still need the physical standards because of what we physically demand of, of our force. However, we sometimes we've overemphasized certain things in it uh, to the detriment of cognitive agility, which is where we're at, where we're in what we physically demand of our force. However, sometimes we've overemphasized certain things in, in uh, to the detriment of cognitive agility, which is where we're at, where we're inflecting on right now, sir. Absolutely. We've got time probably for a quick uh, lightning round of two more questions. Uh, first, next question. 9-11 was a catalyst for military recruiting. As United States Special Operations Command continues to shift its focus away from direct action, is SOF experiencing challenges in retention or recruiting? Uh, how about we start with Akil and maybe Katie, I know you're, you've done a lot of background work on, on the on, uh, human resource side, and talent management side, maybe give you a chance to comment as well, but go ahead, Akil, any thoughts on that? Thanks, Dr. Wilson. I'm probably coming with an outside perspective, so don't have the numbers here on this. Um, I think, and maybe this goes a little bit, uh, what I will offer is in conjunction with the last question, I don't think we need to see it as a, I'm in active duty or I'm out of active duty. I think there's a lot of relationships that we can have. I look at the National Guard model. I mean, talk about an amazing capability that uh, the U.S. Army has, has developed where I have people working in all sorts of incredible industries on the outside, but can also come back and leverage when the nation requires. And I would like to think, as, as, you know, as, as the question was posed earlier, that, that we can question what that relationship looks like. To the, your second point, I think uh, in terms of you know, re retention, my argument is, um, I think in, in many ways, the, the desire to serve is still very, very strong. Actually, in, in many ways, um, I think the desire uh, to do something where the mission matters uh, and may not be necessarily creating the next, uh, dare I say, Facebook filter or something like that. Um, I, I, I do think we're, we're seeing a generation that wants to work on problems that matter and, and special operations and the broader, not even special operations, the broader national security uh, enterprises is, is still going forward on that. Yeah, really quick, the only thing that I would add, and I think that Chief Smith would probably have a great perspective on this, is we might have overcorrected on the kind of deploy to dwell type of ratio that we were getting. I mean, people were deployed too much for many years. Um, now there are many people feeling kind of underused after 20 years of continuous deployments and really feeling like they were part of something bigger. 
So I think that there's probably a happy medium in there that we can get people out in the field overseas, feeling that they're contributing to um, the bigger picture while also maintaining, you know, family readiness back home. And we do not have a recruiting issue at present. We have a retention issue potentially that we're working through the analysis is early, but we want to make sure there's meaningful employment to Colonel Crom's point of making sure that, that, the, that the force feels properly employed in support. Folks, I promise one more question. I was told we've got an extra minute because we got started a little, a slightly a little bit late. So I'm going to steal a little bit more time. Just ask one more. I just want to ask you all, each of you, you know, and, and this, is, this is coming from left field for you. Um, so here it comes, you know, as we think about what soft looks like and needs to be and become next 20 years, 2040, what key trends do you think about what, you know, maybe name one each of key trends to be on the, on the outlook for maybe something that keeps you up at night, uh, either from fright or, or from peril or promise, something that excites you about the trends that we're seeing today and where it may, where it may be leading us forward. Um, how about we start with, uh, Shay. I would say not necessarily frightening, but just something that um, last key point that was made is like making people feel like, you know, valued members of the team being able to contribute. So um, very, very um, specifically, you know, having having a an end state, having something that we're working towards um, that being very specifically, you know, communicated so people can attach to it uh, and contribute to it. Outstanding. Hey, Akil, how about how about for you? Yeah, I think the key attribute is. Um, a, a willingness to take risks and, and experiment. We're not going to develop a more optimized force if we don't have a culture in which we create the opportunity to do so. Many of those will fail. We're not going to get the right MTO or formation or technology integrated off the first bet. That's what the innovator's dilemma is all about. Uh, but to enable that culture of risk taking and see that in an individual level, I think is key. Katie? Yeah, and mine's kind of along those lines. It, it, it really goes back to my main point of understanding. I think what really keeps me up at night um, is kind of the climate change, mass migration, weaponization of refugees around the world issue. Um, and to Chief Smith's point at the beginning, it's going to be more Hades and less Afghanistans, you know, coming up. And we need to be prepared with the type of people that, A, want to tackle that type of mission, and B, understand the context and the culture around it when they get there. Outstanding. Command Chief, over to you. Yes, sir. Mine's atrophy. What keeps me up at night is readiness atrophy. So on the 10th of September 2011, we had done 1,000 exercises for that one op. As somebody who was seven days after 9-11 deployed forward, standing up, and the second U.S. guy into Pakistan to kind of start working those pieces, seven years of my life forward, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, North Africa, working across there. I never worried about readiness. Right now with policy and where we're at in the world, I get worried or what concerns me is maintaining a state of crisis response readiness for whatever our nation requires. Whatever our nation requires. Thanks so much for that, uh, Command Chief Smith. Um, and right along with you, that's what would, would tend to keep me up late at night from a, from a what worries me, but from a what excites me and the great promise ahead. I mean, I got to tell you, the perfect answer to this question of what should soft look like for the tw outwards to 2040, uh, before the first word was said, uh, as soon as we all popped up visual on screen, I think we've got our answer to that. And with that, these are the things that help me sleep very well and comfortably tonight amid all this ambiguity. You know, we've got these great, these great leaders uh, today that are going to be leading the force uh, into that next 20, 20, 30, 40 years plus going, going forward. I want to thank you all for what uh, I think we kept our promise for a very informative and provocative uh, um, conversation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our great host, Peter Bergen. Peter, thank you very much. Over to you, sir.